You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. So this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have uh, Kirsten Shockey. She's the co-author of uh, a book about fermentation, which we'll get into. But her and Christopher Shockey, they're, they're co-authors of uh, the book's called Fiery Ferments, um, best-selling fermented vegetables, and uh, forthcoming uh, miso, tempa, natto, and other tasty ferments, a step-by-step guide to fermenting grains and beans for umami and health. So sounds interesting. Uh, Kirsten, thanks for coming. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so how did you uh, find out about the world of fermentation? What got you into it? Um, you know, it it's kind of a organic organic story, I guess. We we moved to our homestead 20 years ago and um, just really wanted our children to be in touch with where their food came from. And so, you know, we got animals and had big gardens and and of course, cool. making all that food. Yeah, it was cool. <laughs> making all that food, you suddenly realize, oh no, I have to figure out how to preserve this food, right? <laughs> and so mm. at first, it was, you know, the first fermentations really that I started doing on the farm were things like cheese because we had dairy animals and and my husband, we had a lot of apple, have a lot of apple trees. And so he started doing cider. Um, and then But vegetables were still, you know, either frozen, dried, or canned. And in about 1999, my mom actually gave us a pot of, or a crock full of fermenting cabbage, sauerkraut. And, um, you know, it was kind of in their early understanding how how these things are. She was a Chinese herbalist and um, Hmm. acupuncturist. And so she was starting to understand how these fermented foods are important in our diet. And so we started started doing that and that grew into a believe it or not a farmstead little sauerkraut company and that was going really well except we realized that so many people wanted to understand this book so we had the or this food so we had the idea to write write the first book the fermented vegetables book just to kind of help people understand what kind of was lost over the last hundred years <laughs> yeah I've, I've been curious about fermented foods too but i'm sure like like a lot of people you know you worry oh how do you know if it's right or if it's not spoiled and it won't kill you? And, you know, how do you know right. how to do it and will it taste okay? And I mean, what kind of concerns have you heard from people or what kind of things have you gone through? Well, you know, exactly that. Um, people, we haven't grown up with these foods. We've grown up with germ theory and do not leave things out of the refrigerator. So there's nothing intuitive in our current culture that says, yeah, we'll just leave this on the counter for a week and then stick our fork in it and put it in our mouth. Right. <laughs> and so yeah. those, those are exactly the concerns. I don't want to kill my family and I'll have lots of people. They come to me and they say, you know, it seems fine. I think it's fine. I made it. I put it in my fridge, but I haven't been brave enough to taste it yet. Um, mm-hmm. But the cool thing is, especially like with vegetables, if it's, if it's fermented properly, you're going to know. If it's fermented improperly, you're going to know. There's there's no death by fermentation. Um, nobody's died from fermented vegetables or 
you know, any of these ferments actually, when they go south, it's really obvious. Unlike, you know, canned green beans, which are famous for botulism where it's hidden, tasteless, right. odorless. That doesn't happen with fermentation. So when it goes south, you know, like all your five senses say, do not put me in your mouth. Oh, is it? <laughs> oh it's obvious that it's horrible. Huh. Yeah, like like the texture will be very wrong and the smell will be not just funky. I mean, you know, funky is one thing, but it'll be like compost or rotten potatoes or, you know, something that's like, oh, no, that's foul. <laughs> And so, so what, is, or, what are some of the most common uh, ferments that people can make? Um, well, the most, I mean, the most common, easiest one is is in that sauerkraut or kimchi range where you're just, um, you know, mixing your vegetables with some salt and you're creating a brine and you're keeping it, you know, in a jar in an anaerobic condition for, you know, five days, seven days, two weeks, just it all depends on the temperature and how sour you want it. But, in, you know, then it's done. Like you're you're ready to go. So that's probably one of the most common. People that don't like those kind of vegetables really like the hot sauces and it's just as easy to ferment some peppers up and have a sauce, you know, in two to three weeks. What, what else do you find that holds people back? Is it, you know, are some people just not patient enough or do they... Um... Again, they second guess themselves. Like what, what happens to stop people from doing this kind of stuff? You know, I think I think you hit it on the nose both times. Fear, you know, not understanding it, um, and then the second part is second guessing if I can do this. Um, you know, sometimes all it takes is is just seeing somebody else set up a jar and be like, oh, it's really not tricky. <laughs> um, and then I think also just. Anytime stepping into something new, you think it's going to take a lot of time. And, you know, that the truth is most of these ferments um, are super quick and you've made it and you don't, you don't eat a whole lot at a time. And so now you've got this convenience food. You know, I've got lots of ferments in my fridge. And so when I'm not wanting to cook or, you know, don't have a lot on hand, it's like I throw those and some of the things that are in my fridge, you know, in a wrap and I, you know, suddenly have this nutrient dense, really bright tasting thing to eat. And so I think it's that combination of not trusting themselves and a little bit of time. But um once people are into it then then it's game on. <laughs> when you um do a lot of these ferments you can you cook them and eat them and still get all the benefits or does cooking destroy the uh beneficial bacteria? Or is fermenting just a way to put food on pause for a while so you could have it later? Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on. So let's talk, let me talk real quick about what is going on. So what happens is, you know, the microbes are transforming the food. Um, let's, we'll just use vegetables because we've been talking about those. They'll get in there and they start consuming the starches, the carbohydrates, sugar, and all of that. And as they do that, they're, um, sort of pre-digesting it for you. And so they're, eating those sugars and changing those sugars that maybe we can't digest anyway into something that is readily available for us. Um, as they do that, it's creating that um, enzymes and the acid. And so when you eat that fermented food, um, you're now getting these foods that the, the vitamins are more available to you. You're, you're able to uptake them more readily than, say, a raw carrot versus a fermented carrot. Um, and you're, you're also, some of those sugars are being processed out of there. So you're, you know, you're getting more that way too. Vitamin C goes up. Vitamin 12 is now on board. Um, K2. So there's a lot happening and you're getting, like I said, this acidity and the enzymes. Um, and those enzymes are helping you digest not only that food that you're eating, but whatever that meal is that you're having with the food. Um, so then there's the probiotics and that's the, the part that would, you know, get killed by cooking. So, um, anything under 105 degrees, you're going to get the live probiotics. You get up over that, um, to about 135 degrees, you're still going to get the enzymes, digestive enzymes helping you out there. Um, and above that, you know, you're getting a nice warm meal and you're also getting the added, um, 
nutritional benefits of it being pre-broken down and those vitamins and all of that. So it's kind of a complicated <laughs> answer, but anyhow, you choose to eat these foods, you're going to still get some benefits versus just, you know, a raw, the raw vegetable. The other thing, and this is that's, back um, to the that's safety. A, that's, a really good, that's a really good way to explain it, by the way. So keep going. Oh, good. <laughs> You're saying safety? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So getting back to the safety, the other thing that's really interesting is as that acid happens, right? So um, these ferments, not only are they not, um, they're very safe and not dangerous, but in places where, you know, third world areas where they can't eat raw vegetables because of the bad microbes that could be on them, they can eat those vegetables raw when they're fermented because the acidity that develops with the lactic acid doing its thing um, kind of pushes out and kills all the bad microbes. So it's kind of cool that way too. So it, it actually can be more healthy for places where you can't get clean food. Have you observed people um, fermenting using organic vegetables versus not? And is there a difference that you can tell? Um, you know, for the most part, I have never seen any huge problems with non-organic vegetables. Um, most people try to use organic. I try to use organic, but I've also, you know, some places they're just not available. And I've done, I've done krauts that have been in other ferments that have been fine with, with non-organic vegetables. Um, some things, um, get irradiated. You know, when they're like, if they're imported and I've seen that to be, that's, that's the place that I've seen sort of a problem because then all the microbes have been killed off, you know, when it goes through that machine. Um, and then well, also these, uh, these ferments, do you have to use a starter culture or can you just naturally have it ferment in the ambient? Yeah. Everything you need is on the vegetables. All those microbes are there and ready to go. As long as you don't, you know, you don't want to wash your vegetables with antibiotic soap or anything like that. Um, they're all there. They're ready to go to work for you. So you don't need a starter culture at all. You need, like I said, a little salt and a little time. Well, what if you compare, um, you know, doing, uh, I don't know, kimchi with a starter versus not or anything else you ferment? Like, do you have any, like, are you proud of any of the microbes you've had for like 30 years that you keep reusing? You know, like the boudin bread baking in San Francisco, they have like right. the same yeast from 100 years ago. Do you have any of that? Right. With um, with the vegetable ferments, we don't. With some of our other f ferments, either the the dairy ferments, um, like the kefir, and we, we of course, do sourdough, and we, we do that. Um, but with the vegetable ferments, there really isn't um, much of a point in and you mentioned kimchi. It's interesting in Korea, of course, it's a really important um, staple in their diet. And as it's becoming more industrialized, as people aren't making their year's supply of kimchi at home anymore, they're buying it. And so I've done a lot of studies. And one of the studies I read a number of years ago said that um, not only could they not speed up the process really with adding a starter culture because, you know, companies were trying to make kimchi faster, um, mm -hmm. but still have it be fermented. Um, they didn't speed up the process. And in some cases they found that the microbes on the vegetables were actually interrupted by the starter culture. And so it kind of, you know, they had to duke it out, if you will, to, to kind of get, get themselves going because there was just, so much going on, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, that is. Huh. Have you tried it? Have you tried to do starters on stuff normally that doesn't have starters? And was it a non-starter when you did? Yeah, Joe. <laughs> well, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't, they they work. What's interesting to me is there, so there's there's a whole host of bacteria that, that make, that are in the lactobacillus family, and they kind of have this succession, right? Um, the first one that moves in the first one that wakes up, I guess, they're all there on the vegetable, but the first one that wakes up is um, its whole job is to start getting that acidity level down. And it can live in that, you know, higher acidity environment that you're starting out with. And as it, as it does its thing, you know, and that's when you're going to see that really active fermentation. As soon as it gets to a certain point in the acidity, um, the pH goes down, it dies off because it's made its own environment to acidic but as soon as it does it kind of wakes up the next species and this kind of goes on over and over again 
And why I'm explaining this is I've, you know, seen some starter cultures out there on the market that um, are El Plantarum, which is um, a really good um, microbe for, for us, a probiotic. But the thing with El Plantarum is if you put it in your starter, I mean, in your sauerkraut, it's not going to, it's not going to get started until the native microbes, wild ones that came with it, have already gotten it down to a lower, a lower ratio. So yeah, I've used starter cultures, but I haven't noticed any, any reason to, it's just a, you know, for me, it's something that I'd need to make sure I had on hand and, and, you know, it's more cost and, and it takes away from just, oh, I'm at the market. I see this vegetable that looks beautiful. I'm going to go home and ferment it, you know, because most of these starter cultures, you'd have to mail order or whatever. Okay, interesting. So in the world of fermenting, like what should a novice attempt and not attempt and how about more advanced people? Um, well, I think in the world of vegetables, I think a novice can really go for what they'd like to go for. Um, carrots are a really successful ferment. Um, sauerkraut, kimchi, um, you know, like I said, hot sauce. So in the world of vegetables, I think, I think it's, it's pretty wide open, um, to get started and, and feel confident and that they, everything you have, you have, or everything you need, you have in your house, salt in a jar. Um, and you know, the ones that are starting to get a little more complicated, um, would be the things that are in that new book that's coming out, Miso Tempe Nato and other ferments because it's the grains and the beans and now you're starting to deal with different micros not just lactobacillus and they have whereas the um, vegetables you know they're happy on the counter but some of these other ones you've got to start thinking about um, incubation and keeping things at more narrow temperatures what about making uh, like your own yogurt That's, yeah uh, yogurt yogurt's pretty easy, a great or... pretty easy um yeah this one you also have, you know, incubation temperatures to deal with, but um, that can be done. A lot of times people are able to do that by wrapping, you know, their cultured milk in, um, well, the jars in the towels and then putting them in the oven with, you know, like the light on and that keeps it that nice temperature for the yogurt to happen. So, yeah, and yogurt, of course, needs, it's a lactic ferment as well, but it, you do need to um, start it with a culture. Yeah, it's weird. I have like this idea that, you know, in, in the store you can get <clears throat> yogurts, but they don't, you know, they, they may have supposedly a few billion bacteria. But I wonder if like you can make a yogurt with trillions of bacteria and get like a super, you know, super probiotic out of it if you make a good one. Um, you know, there's so many wonderful different cultures that do have um, very different things than, than maybe what they're using industrially. So, you can, you know, get a lot of diversity that way. Um, as far as, you know, specific numbers, it's kind of an interesting thing because the um, live bacteria are alive as long as there's food, right, for them to eat and keep them alive. Um, and so depending on, you know, if you, if you get that yogurt when it's really young and fresh and those bacteria are really stable, you're going to have way more. But as that yogurt you know, continues to ferment or whatever, those bacteria can die off. Luckily, what happens when we put our ferments, yogurt or um, vegetables or whatever in the fridge, we put them to sleep basically and sort of put them into a stasis. And that's why um, when you buy these things, they are still live. <laughs> well, I was so wondering, really what hard. if you were able to, um, what if you were able to, you know, ferment and make a, uh, I don't know, dry out some of the ferments and make like a powder? that was stable for a little while. And then when you go out to eat, you take it and you sprinkle it on your food. So you could, uh, you know, if you eat out, you could essentially like improve your food with a whole bunch of bacteria on it that are beneficial before you eat it. Absolutely. Um, we, we've we um, been playing around a lot with that because we're backpackers and the uh, weight of them dry versus ferments is also a big difference. And so what you can do is as long as you're dehydrating them, you know, I like to do it at a, like 100 degrees. I don't because you don't want it going over that 103, 105 mark where they'll where they'll die. And yeah, we'll make powders out of kimchi or whatever, and then we'll have like this kind of salty, tasty seasoning that also has a probiotic quality to it. Yeah, just the, yeah, it's something that you can travel with that would help uh, you know heal your gut when you, you eat at places where the food's crappy. Right, for sure. 
Yeah, I just envision there'll be a really cool product that you guys can make and sell. Just an idea. Right. <laughs> well, we're actually, uh, yeah, we're actually working on, um, it's funny you mentioned that because it is, we are working on that whole idea of, of that because we've been traveling so much ourselves and, you know, we can't always take our normal ferments with us. So we are working on, okay, like how, how can we make this into something that people would be interested in? Have you ever, um, have you experimented where, you know, let's say you've had, you've been sick or something happened with you and you try to, uh, you know, somehow like medicate yourself or heal yourself with, with your ferments and you got into that part of the realm? Um, definitely when, you know, my stomach is a little off, um, I feel so much better if I have a little sauerkraut juice or something like that. Um, what I have noticed is I I feel like in the last, especially, you know, maybe eight to five years, 10 years or so, since these have been so much more part of our lives, um, that we were talking about it the other day. I haven't gotten, you know, a, a real, and this is just me, but you know, an intestinal flu kind of thing. I've gotten more of the other kind of flu, but not that intestinal flu where things are just wanting to purge. <laughs> and I don't know right. if there's any relationship or if, but I do know that, um, you know, we have something fermented at least once a day. Yeah, I wonder like if you get sick or someone you know and they have to take antibiotics, you can give them a little, uh, you know, bit of your special powder or ferments to help uh, balance the... Uh, the gut killing effects of, of antibiotics. Right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, and my husband had to take antibiotics when we were on a trip in uh, Chile and we definitely hit him with everything <laughs> and he's doing pretty good now or he's doing just fine now. He was, um, oh, good. I think it helped him kind of get through that. So you have your book, but do you, uh, are you selling ferments commercially? Is you know, we, we don't, Bags of that. Nope. Nope. We don't do that at all anymore. We sell books and we sell, um, you know, the knowledge we go teach places and, and, uh, are hoping to get some online things going that way at some point. But at this point it's, it's all about empowering folks to, you know, make their own probiotics. Have you thought about doing like an online course, a series of videos on how to, you know, make this side or the other? Cause that would be pretty totally. scalable. You know? Yeah, no. And we totally want to do that. We've done, We've actually recorded a few things, but, um, and want to make, you know, kind of a, a little bit of a curriculum to go with it, not just a, a video, but, you know, actually some, some more substance. So people really, what I want is I want people to feel like they really can go into the kitchen and do it, you know? And so we've been working on that just so many hours in a day, you know? <laughs> yeah. Have, have you tried to ferment anything strange that you've never heard has been fermented before? Have you ever tried that? Um, what was I from? Gosh, you know there. Yes, I have, and it's like blanking on me right now on what I've what I was doing. It was fairly recently too. Um, but can you ferment oh, coffee that I, you would drink? Or? You know, you people do make um, kombucha out of coffee. Uh, we have a cider book that's coming out next year, and I guess this is I don't know that nobody's ever done this before, but. I had a lot of fun um, capturing wild yeast and uh, of blossoms and seeing how those interacted with the apple juice to flavor the cider. So instead of buying, you know, commercial yeast or even using just the wild yeast on the apples themselves, it was we were using pasteurized juice and um, having the cider ferment from from the yeast of of different botanicals and blossoms. Well, very cool. So where, do you, um, where are you currently doing your classes? I mean, it sounds like the best resource for people is to get, you know, one or more of your books probably on Amazon or at your website. But, you know, can people meet you in person or take a class or what's another way to interact with you? Yeah, absolutely. We've got, um, we've got on our website, we've got our calendar that we're actually adding to daily right now because our um, pretty much August through November, through mid-November, we're going to be on the road teaching all across the country. Um, so we might we might be That's near cool. near different ple- people. And um, yeah, our website we we do have a. Um, Are you posting your tour dates set- and all that on your website? 
Yeah, it's on the calendar on our website. Excellent. And we've also got a free e-course for folks if they want to sign up for it. It's seven days um, or five, yeah, five ferments in seven days. So it really walks walks new people, beginners through fermentation. Um, and then, yeah, like you said, there's the books and, and uh, yeah, someday there'll be some e-courses out there that are video style. <laughs> Well, very cool. Well, it was like super interesting, and I, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. It was good to talk to you. Yeah, thank you for having me. And um, um, yeah, I are you have you ever fermented anything? Uh, my wife, um, she makes injera. So it's like this. You use teff, and um, I love it's injera. Just, you know, it's really small flour. Yeah, she makes it. Uh-huh. She watched like the videos of real Ethiopian women making it. And she made it, and you should ferment it. Awesome. And, you know, the eyes of the injera open, and it's pretty cool. We, you know, we cook it, it then and eat it. You know, we don't eat it right. raw and stuff, but that's the one thing that she ferments. She she tried a kombucha awesome. once with a scoby. She looked at it. She's like, I don't know about this. And so I, I gave it to the <laughs> dogs and she was horrified, but they liked it. They ate it. So. Yeah. Some people make dog treats out of their scobies on purpose. So the dogs are into it. Lots of, lots of probiotics. But yeah, injera is wonderful. It is. Um, and that fermentation, it breaks, even though you're cooking it, it's not probiotic. You're still breaking down the grains to make them way more um, nutritious for you. So that's cool. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.